Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to the conclusion of our workers' retreat at this time. We thank you because of the many things you've spoken to us. Thank you for many prayers we have prayed. Thank you for many decisions we have taken. We thank you for the consecrations, the vows the sacrifices, everything we have laid upon the altar. We bless your name, O Lord, because you have led us thus far. And we are praying, O Lord, that you will help us to be faithful to everything we have opened our mouth to tell you in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that at this time you reveal your very might unto us so that we'll be able to stand where you want us to stand. To stay and remain where you want us to stay and remain. To glorify you all the days of our lives. Bless us today, Lord. Equip us and prepare us for the journey ahead of us. In Jesus' name, we pray. We are grateful to the Lord for how fire he has helped us. Already you have been ministered to from a general choir as well as the special singing, calling us to march on because there's still a lot ahead of us, not only to march on, asking us a question if we have vowed a vow, you've taken a decision, you made a pledge. You've consecrated yourself to the Lord. Are you standing on that vow, on that consecration? Or are you shifting aside? Are you forgetting all that you have opened your mouth to tell the Lord? The Christians of this present generation, they do not understand, they do not know the importance of vows and consecrations. In the Old Testament, the word vow comes up quite a number of times. In the New Testament, the word that comes up is the word to consecrate. And they are the same. In the Old Testament, when you brought something to the Lord, like an animal, or you brought your child, like Anna brought Samuel, or you brought yourself, like a Nazarite brought himself, or you dedicated your time, your property, anything to the Lord, in the Old Testament, they refer to that as a vow. In the Old Testament, whenever you open your mouth, and you say like Jephthah, O Lord, I'm going to the battlefield. If you will grant me victory, and you will make the children of Israel, whom I am leading, to overcome the enemy. 
to glorify your name, to exalt yourself. Whatsoever comes first and meets me at the time I'm returning from the battlefield to celebrate the victory, I will dedicate, I will offer, I will surrender completely unto you in the way it will please you. In the Old Testament, we'll call that a vow. And when Jephthah was coming back, here was the daughter, the only daughter, and met him. And then Jephthah said, I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I will not go back. We we'll call that in the Old Testament a vow. But in the New Testament, when you find a man that all the prophets came around, and there somebody bound himself with the girdle of that man and said, So shall they bind this man that has this girdle in the place he'll be going. And then all the people of that place began to plead with him that he will not go because bounds and afflictions awaited him in Jerusalem. And then while they were weeping, he looked straight at them and said, Why do you weep? To break my heart, to change my course, to turn me around. Why are you weeping like that? Then he said, Because I've made up my mind that I'm going to go to that Jerusalem to do the work the Lord has told me to do. And I'm not just expecting to be bound. I do not even care whether there is death. In the Old Testament, what do you call that? You would have called that a vow. In the New Testament, we call it a consecration. When a man in the New Testament rises up, and it says, when it pleased the Lord, who brought me out of my mother's womb, and then he has now set me for to reveal the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, I conferred not with flesh and blood, but that I'm reaching forward, that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended, and I'm pressing on, forgetting those things that are past, that I may lay hold on it, so that I'll be able to be a partaker of his resurrection, the power of his resurrection. In the Old Testament, you'll call that a vow. In the New Testament, you'll call it a consecration. And here we find Jesus Christ he was going, and a great multitude followed after him. And he looked at the people, and he said, Whosoever be he of you that does not hate father and mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yea, even his own self as well, he cannot be my disciple. And then he said, Whosoever he be of you that will not forsake all things, he cannot be my disciple. And eventually we read in another record, one of the disciples said, Lord, we are forsaking all. What shall we have? When you look at those disciples who had forsaken all, and they pledged themselves that rain or sunshine, persecution or problem, life or death, angels or principalities, they were fully persuaded that nothing will turn them around. That they were, even if it appears we're killed all the day long, we're going to be more than conquerors and we're going to fight the fight of faith until the very end. You'll call that a vow in the Old Testament. You call it a consecration in the New Testament. But the Christians of this present generation, they do not understand vows. They do not understand consecration. In fact, the nominal Christians, the white garment people, they understand consecration and vow more than born again Bible believing Christians. Sometimes you will find in your neighborhood there will be a woman that had been seeking for children. And this woman seeking for children will go for a particular convention of the religious people and then in that convention that woman will say oh god if you will give me a child that child will be dedicated to the service of the lord all the days of his life and then even though that woman 
is not born again. Even though in that place they are not worshipping God the biblical way. But they, knew, they know little of the word of God. God, so as to show, he gives rain to the just and the unjust. A sunshine he brings upon the saints and the sinners. He'll give that woman a child. And that woman you will find will name the child. It may be God answers prayer in her local language. Or it may be prayer as favored me. Or it may be you will name that child prayer is profitable. Or it may be God has given this child to me. He will name that child and from the very little age, the mother will be telling the child, you belong to God. You don't belong to the family. Before I got you, I prayed. And I told God that I will give you unto the Lord. And the mother will say, my child, when you go to school, understand you are going to end up serving God, that mother may not even be born again. And the child will say, well, that was your vow. That was your consecration. I have my own life to live. Mother will say, my child, be careful. I told God already that you will never prosper if you don't obey and agree with that vow. And it may be this child will just say, no, I don't want to listen to that. That's between you and God. Because the child may not know the importance of vow and consecration. And he will try this way, he will fail. He'll try this way, he will fail. He will try this way, he will fail. And then he might go to a gospel church. And as he gets to that gospel church, he hears the gospel. And as he hears the gospel, he's born again. And then he's just discussing with a friend. And he said, you know, I try this and it fails. I try that and it fails. I try that and it fails. And a friend will say, what's the meaning of this, your initial? I know your son, what's the meaning of this, your initial? And then he will say, well, the meaning of this initial is that I asked him from God. That's your name? Why are you trying to be any other thing? Your mother must have consecrated you to the Lord. And then the brother or the sister will open up and say, Yes, it took a long time before my mother had me. And when my mother had me, eventually, even, she even told me that he had, she had vowed and given me to the Lord completely. And then the other friend will tell our brother and say, That is why you are not prospering. You are rebelling against the vow of your mother. And I know there are people here that in our local language, your name signifies that before you were born at all, your mother went here, your mother went there, your mother went there, your mother went there. Eventually, your mother knelt and said, God, I've been going everywhere. If you will give me a child, that child, like Samuel, will belong to you. And here you are. You've been running away. And you said you didn't understand vow. Before you were even born, there was a vow upon your head. Before you, were ever, before you ever came into this world at all, this thing that we're talking about today, consecration, was already wrapped around your neck. And there's no way you can go. You are consecrated unto the Lord. Until you come to the Lord fully to say, Lord, now I come voluntarily. It was my mother that said it before. But now myself, I come voluntarily. You'll never be able to find rest. And then, let's think about ourselves. Since we are born again. You know, some people say, I will never make any vow. Ah, oh, you've made vows already. Since we are born again. Oh Lord, if you save me, I'll serve you. That's a vow. Oh Lord, here I come. I hear of the peace of salvation. I hear of the holiness and the purity you can give to your own people. And I want it. I want what Christ did for me on the cross of Calvary. Lord, if you will save me, I will never go back to the world. That's a vow. Oh Lord, I want to work for you. I don't want my life 
to be spent in the things, mundane things of the world. I've read about D.L. Moody, great, great evangelist. I've read about John Wesley, a man that changed, transformed his generation for Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, I've heard about Charles G. Finney, who was supposed to be a lawyer, but he dedicated himself and he preached the gospel. He'll be preaching like this. People will be trembling and weeping and crying. And they'll be praying for hours without being able to stop that prayer. I've read about other people that served the Lord. And they gave themselves unto the Lord. I've read about other people in our country here. And they served the Lord. And then you said, oh Lord, here is my life. Because of what Jesus did... Because you brought me to a church like this, O oh Lord, I will serve you. And I'm not just going to serve you here and there. I will serve you here. And Lord, I am going to win souls as well. And then when we talk about vows, we say, I never made any vow. What is that one? You remember? When you, when you came here? Or maybe it was in your local church. And a message came out. And a person that preached the message himself. He said, here we are. God has bought us. The blood of Jesus Christ has washed us. And it was, you know, the spirit of God so came upon him. And then he said, at that time, he said, look at this church. Look at the doctrine. Look at the life. Then he said, we have never seen this in any other place. Then he said, to lead the way that I, the preacher myself, I give myself unto the Lord and I will serve the Lord. Then he said at that time, in this our church. And he said, I will never look back. I will never go back. He prayed. He sang. He cried. Then he said, God, if I ever go back away from what I uttered before you, then he did like Ruth. God do so to me. And more also, if aught but death part you and I. And then while he said that, you as part of the congregation, the Spirit of God came upon you like it came upon Jephthah. The Spirit of God came upon you like it came upon Saul, upon Paul the Apostle. And the Spirit of God came upon you and you were shaking to your very roots. You cried. You sang. You prayed. Then you said... Oh Lord, I have only one life to live. And that life, I yield, I surrender unto you. Whatever I meet along the way, I am going to serve you till the very end. Then you also said, devil, you may pull trouble with me. Demons of hell, you may cause trouble anyhow, anywhere. And all enemies, you may even marshal and, and conspire together with human enemies. But I serve you, notice devil. I am going to serve the Lord till the end of my life. That was a vow. And now, see us today. When troubles come, we say, I never made any vow. I just said I'm born again. I just said I'm going to serve the Lord. No, you said more than that. I just said that I'll keep on reading the Bible. No, you said more than that. I heard you. Angels heard you. God heard you. Jesus heard you. And our Christian brothers and sisters heard you. Some of you at the retreat, you stood on the pulpit. And you put a curse upon yourself. You said, if I ever go back, we heard you. That was a vow. It's the strongest vow any man can make in the New Testament dispensation. I about the other vows. When that morning, you just, you were having your quiet time. And you read the word of God. You try to read other verses. The spirit of God will not allow you. You kept on that verse. Then tears began to run down your cheeks. And you say, Lord, I surrender. Don't you remember? You were late to go to work that day. Because you forgot time. And you read that Bible. And you prayed. And you cried. And you said, Lord, if I have a thousand tongues, they will sing your praise alone. It was that time, do you remember you said, I'm no more interested in politics. 
I'm not interested in social status. I'm not interested in this. In fact, what did you say? You said, oh Lord, even if I will be a doormat in the house of God, if nobody will give me anything to do, if they will not call me by any title, any big name, oh Lord, I'm going to stay here and die for the glory of God. What is that? A vow. And our ministers through singing, they asked us a question. Have you vowed a vow to the Lord? And why did you forget so soon? You didn't even remember you vowed a vow to the Lord. And you did. And you did. And all those things who have opened our mouths to tell the Lord. And we have said, O oh Lord, I will follow. Seek or thin. Difficulty or danger. Whatever may be in the way. You even use the words of Martin Luther. Though there be devils as many as tiles on the ground and on the ceiling i will follow through till the very end all that the lord is telling us today is to come back to the realization that we have made vows and we need to stay by the vows that we have made in psalm 50 reading from verse 5 gather my saints together unto me those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Those are the saints of God. Those are the saints of God. Gather them together. Bring them together. And here we are gathered together before the Lord. Those that have made a covenant with me. Those that have made a vow unto me. Those that have consecrated their entire lives unto me. They have known me, made covenant with me by sacrifice in psalm 118 psalm 118 and in verse 27 god is the lord he always will be which has showed us light by the sacrifice which cuts even unto the horn of the altar it's reminding you of the time that Abraham made a sacrifice unto the Lord, he sat by it, he watched it. And when the birds were coming, the fowls were coming to take those sacrifices away and to defile the sacrifice that Abraham had made, he was driving them away, driving them away. The birds will come to you. The demons sometimes will tempt you and test you. Even humans will test you and tempt you. Something you have laid upon the altar. A thought will come. Haven't I given too much to God? Haven't I said so much to God? Haven't I offered so much to God? See, here is another sister. She is not offering as much as that to God. See, here is another brother. He is not consecrating as much as that to the Lord. Why did I ever give all this to the Lord? Those birds will come to begin to take it away once again. Take the sacrifices away, the offerings away, the consecration away, the vows away, one by one. But then it says, if you are going to avoid that, like Abraham stood by it, and was driving all those birds away. Then it says, you will bind the sacrifice with the cords upon the altar. Which means, you know that the devil will come. The devil will like to take things away. The devil will like to decrease your commitment and consecration and vows. The devil will like to make you a liar before the Almighty. The devil will like to make you a person that has said something unto the Lord. Then you are regretting, why did I love the Lord so much? Why am I giving to God so much? Why am I surrendering my whole life to the Lord so much? Why am I surrendering my everything that I ever dreamed about? Why am I surrendering each unto the Lord? The devil will bring the temptation. Bind the sacrifice upon the horns of the altar of the cords that will never, never be broken. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, from verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Present your bodies unto the Lord. Ah, oh, you see? How does the Lord need my body? Didn't you see uh, our sisters and brothers who sang this morning? Uh, what did they used to sing? Was it their soul alone? Their spirit alone? Their mouth? Their feet? And they also had to use their hand in holding the script of the music. You need to present your body to the Lord. He needs your feet. It's not just your, it's not your, your soul, just your heart. He needs your body. He needs your energy. He needs the physical part of you. He needs the totality of the man, spirit, soul, and body. And you want to present your body unto the Lord as a living sacrifice. That is the acceptable, reasonable service. In Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. From verse 7 and verse 8. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. You think about a man that would have been great in the world, Paul the Apostle. In fact, he said in Galatians, he said, I profited in the Jewish religion more than all my equals. He was very near to the people in authority. In fact, we're told that he had the privilege of being in the Sanhedrin, the highest council, the highest body among the Jewish people. He forsook all that. He could get letters of authority and he could go into any home and arrest some people and take them into the prison. And once he gave his word and said, keep him there, he had that authority. Then he said, those things that were gained to me, the things that exalted my name, the things that made me greater than all the other people, those things that were gained to me, I, I have counted them lost for Christ. And after one year, he didn't regret it. After two years, five years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years, he did not regret it. He was still so much in the Lord. In fact, until the very time that he died. And he was writing to Timothy. And he said, Timothy, I have fought a good fight. I have run the race. Then he said, I'm very sure of this one thing. Now, a crown is even awaiting me. And it is not only for me, but for all who will follow after my footsteps and love the Lord in that same way. And will love his appearing as well. And here was the man that continually, constantly, all through his life, without any interruption, he said, what things were gained to me? Oh yes, friends would have come and would have said, like Festus said, Paul, Paul, thou art mad. Much learning, much reading, much consecration, much revelation, much knowledge has made you mad. And he said, noble Festus, I am not mad, but I speak words of soberness. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? He left Festus, the distractor. He left the one that will change him. He left the one that will make him to uh, go away from his consecration. He left Festus and he faced Agrippa, King Agrippa. Believest thou the prophets? He didn't allow the man to answer. He said, Agrippa, I know you believe. I, you will not want to doubt those prophets, the words of God. I know you believe. And what could poor Agrippa do? He said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul replied immediately, I would to God. You are not almost just a Christian, but altogether such as I am. Without these bonds. You see, there were people that wanted to distract his attention. That will tell him, uh, Paul the Apostle, you are mad. Much religion has made you mad. He said, no, everything is sober. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. I'm consecrating everything, everything to the Lord. And I've given it up. And the things that were gained to me, I counted them as dung and dross. And something not having any value at all. Look at verse 8. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things. I pray you come to that position this morning. 
all things all things nothing will matter in your life at all you will count all things all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of christ jesus my lord for whom i have suffered the loss of all things and do count them till this present day and do count them i counted them as lost in the past and i do count them now I, it says i still count them dunk that i may win christ that's the language of a person that is really following after the lord and such a person like that will be steadfast you consecrate your life to the lord you make a vow unto the lord you will be steadfast in which way are you steadfast let's think because of a short time just about six important things number one you are steadfast in the word steadfast in the word that is a person that have said with my bible in my hand with my bible in my heart i'm on my way to the kingdom of god and nothing will turn me around i and my bible will be companions tied companions together and i will rather lose my life than lose my bible i will rather lose friends than lose my bible i will rather lose the job than lose the bible i will rather lose the uh, the association with some groups of people than lose my bible i will rather even lose all the protection and the sustenance of my parents rather than lose my bible i will stick to this bible i will read this bible modernism will come it will not take the bible from me superstition will come it will not take the bible from me the traditions of men will come it will not take the bible from me the criticisms of the scoffers will come it will not take the bible from me the, 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 the delusion of the backsliders will come it will not take the bible from me i am consecrated i've made a vow i'm going to live by the bible for the rest of my life the man that is consecrated unto the lord the man that makes a vow to the lord is steadfast in the world of God in second Timothy chapter 4 second Timothy chapter 4 reading from verse 1 I charge thee therefore who can say this for than Paul the Apostle a person himself who had dedicated himself to the word of God who had said I will not move away from a jot or a title of the word of God I've already I'm crucified with Christ nevertheless i live yet it is not i it is christ that liveth in me and the life i now live i live by the faith of the son of god who died for me who gave himself for me a man that had been totally yielded and consecrated a man that had been totally surrendered unto the lord no wonder he could tell another person i charge thee therefore before god and the lord jesus christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom preach the word preach the word preach the word be instant in season and out of season there will be times when you have enough to eat preach it there will be time when you do not have enough to eat preach it there will be time when after the preaching some people will say we well, praise the lord for that message preach it there'll be another time where you will preach and then the person uh, that all the people that hear they will not want to hear preach it a preacher just finished a message and it's uh, overseas where after the message in a moderate little church the people will come and shake the preacher's hand and the preacher that morning had dealt with the word of god line upon line and precept upon precept and the people came to greet him and then this fellow this woman came on the line and shook the preacher's hand and said preacher it's the worst message i ever heard in my life it knocked her sin it knocked her evil deed and the preacher didn't want to take time with her because of the other people on the line that he still wanted to say we're happy you came we hope you'll come again and so the woman because the preacher did not answer she went to join the line again 
And the second time she came and shook the preacher's hand. And the preacher recognized that this was the woman that came before, thinking that maybe she repented. Maybe she now wanted to apologize that I'm sorry for what I said. But she said once again, you didn't understand the other time. This is the worst message I ever had in my life. And then the preacher didn't want to discuss anything about that because the Lord had spoken. You go and handle it the way it has robbed you or pinched you or caught you or pierced you. And the woman, thinking that the preacher did not understand, joined the line again. And it's thought time she came and said, Preacher, you didn't understand, I came two times already. This is the worst message I ever heard. He drove that preacher to his knees and he prayed. And God sent a fellow to him who knew that woman and said, Pastor, don't worry about what that woman is saying. That woman is a psychiatric patient and will just repeat the only sentence she knows that comes to her mind. She will repeat for the whole day. Oh, and the preacher said, thank God I didn't know that. I didn't know she was a psychiatric patient. Don't you know there are a lot of psychiatric patients? They'll frown at you when you preach the word. They will criticize you when you preach the word. And they will say that that wasn't a good message at all. They gossip about you when you preach the word. They will say, I don't enjoy the messages nowadays. Only sin, only repentance, only restitution, only holiness, only going to heaven. How about getting job? How about getting healed? about getting delivered uh -uh. how can we be here for almost a whole week and no word of knowledge no word of wisdom no prophecy no healing no uh, deliverance for the demonized how can we be i don't i didn't enjoy it at all there'll be people like that don't let them distract your attention preach the word and be instant in season and out of season why because you see the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But then the Bible says after their own laws, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall be turned away. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou. Watch thou. In all things endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. And so you want to be totally consecrated to the Lord. You are steadfast in the word of the Lord. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. To the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Be consecrated to the word. And then the people that get involved that you are going to uh, choose to walk along with you. They must be people of the word of God. Titus chapter 1. Verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. That he may be able by sound doctrine. Both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So then. You should be steadfast in the word. Number two. Steadfast in watchfulness. Steadfastness in watchfulness. You see the Lord wants us to watch. Because as we go along in the way. The flesh will say. This is an hard saying. Who can receive it? As you go on along the line, the Lord may even speak directly to you and test your faith and say, See, all those people have gone back. Will you also remain? Along the line, it is possible that with all the difficulties, who will I get married to? Naomi said, If I have hope and I get married tonight and I have a child tonight, will you be able to wait for him? Nay, my daughters. For the hand of the Lord has been heavy upon me. Therefore go back to your people. And then and take rest in the houses of your husbands. And Opa and Ruth lifted up their voices and wept. And said no, we're going to stay with you. And then when Naomi, when she counted the cost for them. 
where you will await. No child. Nobody to inherit all that you have got. Are you sure you are going to wait like that? And up and lifted up her voice and wept. And then left. And that old woman said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and gone back to her idols. Follow at her. And then Rose said, Entreat me not to leave you, not to forsake you, because where you live, I will live. Where you die, I will die. Your God will be my God and your people will be my people. God do so to me. And more also, if aught but death, part you and I and when she saw that she had made up her mind then she left speaking and they went to the land of promise I pray you'll go to the land of promise but you see the flesh will come circumstances will come to tell you that you cannot take this you are weak your circumstances will not permit this look at the suffering Look at all the things that are happening to you. Uh, even if you are going to go to heaven, are you going to go to heaven like this? You have not got this. You have not got this. You have not got that. If you remain in this condition, how are you going to provide for yourself in the future? How are you going to provide for your family in the future? Why don't you go and dust off your books and, and go anywhere and hide away from all these people that are uh, talking consecration, consecration all the time? The temptation will come. That's why you'll need to watch in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. That she enter not into temptation. Brothers and sisters, at a time when you're sick, some special temptations will come. At a time of persecution, some special temptations will come. At a time when the pastor in your local church preaches a message he has never preached before. Hard, right on the line. Almost pointing to you and mentioning your name. Temptations will come. At a time when you are rebuked, some special temptations will come. At a time when you are corrected, some special temptations will come. At a time when your body is tired, when you are weary. When you cannot take any other step. Temptations will come. At a time when you don't have appetite to eat, some special temptations will come. At a time when your region overseer might transfer you to go to a particular place and that place is not as good as the place you are coming from, some special temptations will come. At a time when you are going to get married, some special temptations will come. In a time of courtship, some special temptations will come at a time when you are going to those parents and the parents of the lady they are saying no except you bring wine except you bring this except you bring that some special temptations will come at a time when you are married after three months six months nine months you are not pregnant yet some special temptations will come at a time when you have got a child and I say, Lord, I, it may be jaundice, it may be deformity, it may be a particular sickness upon that child. A special temptation will come. At a time when in the place of your work, others have been promoted, you are not being promoted, some special temptations will come. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Because according to the words of Jesus Christ, that ye may not enter, that ye enter not into temptation. That ye enter not into temptation. Have you sometimes found a person driving and in front of him it is so cloudy and then it just rushes in not knowing that there's a standing vehicle there. He enters into the cloud and it destroys his life. Do you know there are people, the temptation is there in that secretariat, the temptation is there in that village. The temptation is there from those backsliders. The temptation is there from those who have led the path that leads to the way of righteousness and leads to the destination of heaven. The temptation is there from old friends. And they just enter into the cloud of temptation. And they meet that standing object that the devil has placed there, a stumbling block, and they crash their lives right there. A terrible ruin, a terrible wreck. That's why Jesus is saying, watch and pray. That she enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. Oh yes, you see us as we're here. Oh, you are willing. You want to get to heaven. We all want to get to heaven. 
Your spirit is saying, I don't want to go to hell. The spirit is willing. The spirit is saying, I'd like to fly away like a bird and go and rest. I want to go to the very presence of God. Because in the presence of God, there is a fullness of joy. Your spirit wants to go there, wants to go and rest. Your spirit doesn't taste. You see, your spirit doesn't take all that food you taste. Your spirit doesn't drink all that water you drink. Your spirit is not enjoying anything. The only thing your spirit can enjoy is that association, reconciliation, interaction with the almighty God. And your spirit is saying, I'm longing, I'm desiring, I want to fly away. I want to go and be over there. It is your flesh that is enjoying the rice and the pepper soup and the Fanta and the Coke. It is your body, your flesh that is enjoying all the, all the various things and all the air conditioner and everything. It is your body. Your body is saying, what can I get more than this wonderful thing? What can I get more than this sweet rice? What can I get more than this a cold a Coca-Cola? I want to stay here. Your spirit is willing to fly away, but your body, your flesh is weak. And there will always be that struggle. Your body will say, when are we going to have the pleasure of fornication? When are we going to have the pleasure of all these evil things? Are we going to remain like this at 26, at 27, at 32? And we are not married yet? What am I going to do? And your spirit knows that in heaven there is neither marriage nor giving in marriage. Because they are all like the children of God at the time of the resurrection. They are the angel, like the angels of God. But your body is saying, no, I don't want to think about that. I want to enjoy now, now, now. Pray and watch, watch and pray. That ye may not enter into temptation. Because your spirit is willing indeed. But your flesh is weak. Steadfastness, number one, in the world. Number two, in watchfulness. Number three, in worship. You see, we need to be very, very steadfast in worshiping the right way. You see, in this modern day in which we live, you have, a, you have different kinds of worshiping now. And you will see all these styles. There's this style of worship. There's still that style of worship. And there's this style of prayer. There's this style of doing this and doing that. Be very careful. And be steadfast in worshiping the only true God the way he wants to be worshipped. In John chapter 14. Chapter 4. John chapter 4. Verses 23 and 24. But the hour cometh. And now is... When the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. You cannot worship God where, where there is error. Where there is false doctrine. You cannot worship God acceptably if there is no truth there. If the truth, the totality of the truth, the entirety of the truth revealed to us from scripture. If it is not in that place, you cannot really worship God acceptably. The people may say, I enjoy that worship. Their flesh will do that. The people may say, wasn't that a beautiful music where we could dance to the glory of God? Your, the people will hold hands together. Both, uh, you know, men and women, boys and girls, holding hands together. The people would even be dancing together. And they will say, wasn't that great, great worship? Or the works of the flesh? With uh, lasciviousness? With unclean thoughts? with uncleanness in the minds of the people while they say they are worshipping. You can do that. Sometimes you'll find a particular lady that is, uh, you know, maybe wanting to lead choruses. And then you'll find the people with guitars in their hand. And you'll see the way they are even almost holding one another. I'm not talking of uh, beautiful sisters here. I'm talking of the places where they do not know how to worship the Lord. You see them, they'll be holding one another. they almost be kissing right on the platform there. And they'll say they're rejoicing, Lord. Then they begin to play the guitar and begin to sing some choruses. And then it's on the platform, they begin to dance. And all the people there begin to dance as well. And then somebody will invite you. And they will say that, you know, in your church in deeper life, you do not know how to worship. You only stay with doctrine. But you don't know love and fellowship and worship. He'll say, I'll take you somewhere. Don't take me anywhere. This is good enough for me. Jesus wasn't dancing with Mary. And Jesus worshipped God. 
Because when the devil came and tempted Jesus, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glories thereof. And he said, all these things will I give unto you if you'll bow down and worship me. And then Jesus looked at him in Matthew chapter 4 verse 10. He said, get thee behind me, Satan, because you will worship God. Him only shall thou serve. Jesus worshipped. He wasn't dancing. Jesus worshipped. He wasn't holding Mary or any other woman. Jesus worshipped the Lord. The greatest way. The highest way. And he wasn't doing all these things that the people are doing when they say they are worshipping him. Let us be very careful that we are steadfast in the true worship of God. In this verse 23 it says, When? That it says the, tower, uh, the, the time the hour has come. And now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's not with the body in dancing. It's not with all those movements. It's not with the latest uh, music, uh, musical uh, tempo and rhythm and jazz. It says in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereupon, thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. You see, there are people that are trying to bring in strange fire. Strange fire. And when you see it, you'll know, this is strange this is what we used to do in the pop houses before we were born again. This is strange. This is the very kind of drumming that we used to have in the music club in the world. This is strange. This is worldly music and worldly rhythm and worldly dancing and worldly beating of drums coming into the church. This is strange. But the people will tell you we enjoy it. And the sinners will come in because you know now, they don't have to go to the pop houses and pay any amount of money to, uh, to get into the dancing. It is now free, available for them in the place they call church. That's why the Bible is saying be very careful and be very steadfast in true worship so that you are not guilty of offering strange fire. Number one, be steadfast in the word. Number two, be steadfast in watchfulness. Number three, be steadfast in worship, true worship. Number four, be steadfast in witnessing. You see, when we say we consecrate ourselves to the Lord, and we make vows that we're going to serve the Lord, the very purpose of our vow, the very reason for our consecration, is that we're going to witness, we're going to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said that you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. You will want to preach the gospel. And it doesn't matter. There may be difficulty. There may be trial. There may be persecution. You want to preach the gospel all the time. In Romans chapter 1. Reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 1 verse 14. I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? If you are not ashamed, you will preach it. You will proclaim it. You will declare it. You will tell the people the only way to heaven, the only way to the Father's heart. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad 
went everywhere preaching the word. Which means then that you as a child of God, anywhere you go, everywhere, anywhere you may find yourself, it will be for the purpose of declaring this unchanging, eternal, infallible gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You won't allow fear to close your mouth. You won't allow the criticisms of the people to shut you off. But you will preach the gospel, preach the word, and bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. That will be your commitment. It may even be that you suffer for it, but you are still going to continue. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 from verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. These people suffered for the proclamation of the gospel, for the preaching of the gospel. But even then, even though they suffered, what happened after that? Verse 19. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. They had been imprisoned and now they were delivered. You will think, they will say, I'll never say that again. I'll never preach again. I've suffered enough. Look at all the dribbling and look at all the kicking and look at all the suffering. The angel came and opened the door and said, You are delivered for only one reason. You are brought out of the prison for only one reason. Why it not for that reason? The angel will not have bothered at all. You know why? The angels could not preach the word. And they knew that this is the greatest event taking place in the whole world. The preaching of the gospel. Greater than the teaching in a seminary. Greater than the teaching in the university. Greater than the uh, politics, the activities in the political realm. Greater than all those things in the workshop. Greater than anything in the market. Greater than anything you can ever get involved in. And the angel knew as great as evangelism, as witnessing, as preaching the gospel is, the angels were not allowed to do it. And so when those apostles were in prison, and the greatest thing, I said greater than seminary teaching, greater than college, greater than university, greater than politics, when the greatest thing had been stopped because of the preachers in the prison, he came to open the door and he said, the reason you are delivered, the reason your bondage is taken away, the reason all the restriction is taken away, do you see you are set free? Do you see the miracle has happened? It's not just to be enjoying the miracle and saying, I praise God, look at the miracle he performed. It is to go and stand and speak in the temple to all the people, the words of life. Let us realize in our lives that the reason God has brought us together here, the reason God has delivered us, the reason God has saved us, the reason God has worked miracles in our lives, the reason why all these things have taken place is so that you will, by the grace of God, continue to preach the gospel. Number one, steadfastness in the word. Number two, steadfastness in watchfulness. Number three, is steadfastness in true worship. Number four, steadfastness in witnessing. Number five, steadfastness in the will of God. When we say we consecrate our lives to the Lord, that's just one thing to do. If we're consecrated to the Lord, that is, you say, Lord, not my will anymore, but thine be done. Abraham, take that son, your only son, whom you love, and come and sacrifice him to me on the mount that I will show you. No argument. No debate, thy will be done. And it is that attitude that makes your consecration of value, that you are willing to do the will of God. And this is the greatest thing in our lives, that by the grace of God, we want to do the will of God for the rest of our lives. That's why Jesus taught us how to pray. 
Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The angels do the will of God. They do the will of God without question, without debate, without delay. They do the will of God promptly. They do the will of God constantly. They do the will of God willingly with the whole heart. They do the will of God not having a will of their own. Their wills are totally immersed in the will of God, swallowed up in the will of God. When a man or a woman will say, I cannot take that. I know my age. I know my educational level. I know when I started preaching the gospel. I know when I became born again. I know what I have done in this my life for the glory of God. I know where I've been. I know where I ought to be because of who I am. That thing that they say is the will of God. I cannot accept it. Your consecration is destroyed. Your vow you have contradicted. But a person that is always on the altar. A person that is saying, I yield myself. If it's the will of God, that people shall trample upon me. The will of the Lord be done. Here is a beloved king. His name, David. A man at a God's heart. And here, something had happened. And he was going on the way. And Shimei came and threw stones at him. And threw doors at him. And cursed him. And abused him. And then Joab said, Who is this dead dog to abuse, insult, cast aspersions upon our king? Let me go on the other side and fall on him and take him away. Say, don't touch him. It's the will of the Lord for me. The Lord has permitted him to curse David the king. Therefore, leave him alone. Because I rejoice and I remain in the will of God. A man, a woman that is in the will of God is no more fighting for himself. Is no more defending himself. Whatever is the will of God. In the valley, God's will be done. On the mountain, God's will be done. And the pew, where you are, God's will be done. At the pulpit, God's will be done. When there is hunger, the will of the Lord be done. And when there is enough to eat, the will of the Lord be done. When there is only one dress to wear, the will of the Lord be done. When God has breathed upon some brothers and sisters and they come to give you more clothes, the will of the Lord be done. When you have married and like I seek, I seek the son of promise. There is no child for 20 years. The will of the Lord be done. When you have married and eventually by prayer the child comes again, the will of the Lord be done. When the Lord has taken the righteous away before the evil day, your closest friend, the Lord has taken him to heaven. The will of the Lord be done. And when we are all here, the will of the Lord be done. A child of God that is consecrated to the Lord, that is saying, yes, I lay myself upon the altar. It says, it's prayer every day is, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done here on earth with me as it is in heaven with the angels of God. Number one, steadfastness in the world. Steadfastness in watchfulness. Steadfastness in true worship. Steadfastness in, in uh, witnessing steadfastness in the will of god the lord calls us this morning to come to him and renew our vows and renew our consecrations and say i know the word i have heard today it's coming right from the throne of god and oh lord i don't care what others do i don't care what others say i don't care where others go i don't care what others may want to plan I don't care what happens to other people for me. For me. 
I come right upon the altar. This little life I have, O oh Lord, take it. Take my life and let it be all consecrated unto you. Take my hands, take my lips, take my feet, take my talents, take my gifts, take all that I possess. Not a mite will I withhold from you. And take my love. I pour everything as an offering unto you. Like Abraham will want to stand up this morning. And in your mind, in your heart, travel to the mountain of God. And take that only son, that only life. And take that I seek the son of promise. And take what is greatest in your heart. What is greatest in your life. And say, Christ, you died for me on the cross of Calvary. I come to the mountain of God. I offer everything. I surrender everything. I give everything unto you. Here am I. Take me completely. Here am I. Take me completely. And this vow, this consecration, I will never break. I surrender all I am. I surrender all I will ever be. I surrender everything to the Lord. Here I am, here I am, here I am. I surrender myself completely unto the Lord. Renew those consecrations and vows before the Lord. To serve the Lord till the very end. To serve the Lord till the very end. Don't allow the flesh to pull you down. Don't allow friends to pull you down. Don't allow relatives to pull you down. Don't allow the needs of the present hour to pull you down. Don't allow your carnal reasonings to pull you down. Renew your vows and consecrations before the Lord. What is it that will separate you from the love of Christ? What is it that will separate you from the will of God? What is it that will separate you from the word of God? From watching? From worshipping God in spirit and in truth and in the right place? What is it that will shake your mind? Shake your leg? What is it that will make you to become cold? What is it that will make you to fail God, to disappoint God, to become unfruitful and unfaithful and unloyal unto the Lord? What is it that will make you to look back? Your wife, your husband, your children, your friend, your closest associates? What is it that will make you to look away from the cross of Calvary, from preaching the word? From doing the will of the Father. What is it? Talk to the Lord. Consecrate your life, your time, your talent, all that God has bestowed upon you. Let us consecrate. Let us consecrate. Let us consecrate everything. Let's lay everything on the altar. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. That whatever comes your way. You will never look back. You will never look back. Make up your mind to serve the Lord. Pray that the Lord will help you. Pray that the Lord will uphold you. Pray that the Lord will see you through. Pray that the Lord will help you to take your stand. Pray and pray. Pray and consecrate and rededicate your life unto the Lord. We all have only one life to live. We all have only one life to live. Pray. 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 
I am going to serve the Lord. I'm going to follow through. I'm going to remain. I will not go back. I will not look back. I will not remove my hand from the plow of righteousness, of holiness, of purity, of preaching the word of God. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bless your name. We worship and magnify you because of what you have shared with us this morning. We thank you for reminding us of all the faults that you have made unto you. We thank you for reminding us of how we have consecrated our life, our time, our talent, even consecrating ourselves to the extent that we are saying that we are not going to look back. We are not going to leave this place. We are going to remain loyal, faithful, dedicated, consecrated unto you. But what is it that is happening today? Many, many, many are no longer stable. Many are no longer consistent. Many people are looking back because of one problem or the other. We have disappointed you. We have failed you. Lord God of heaven, we pray that you will forgive us in Jesus' name. Father, we are sorry. We are sorry because you have defrauded, because you have disappointed you, because you have let you down. All that you have power to do, all that you have consecrated to do, we have not been able to do it. The preaching of the gospel, laying everything down on the altar of sacrifice, our talent, our money, our will, everything that you have. We have opened our mouth at one time or the other. And we have said, Lord, it is for you and for you only. But today, today, because of side attraction and distractions, because of people that are falling away, we are now shaking. We are no longer consistent. We are becoming cold. Father, we are sorry. Have mercy upon us in Jesus' name. Father, we have come back unto you. We have come back unto the, unto the Father. We have come back home. We are making up our mind. Receive us in Jesus' name. Because you have given us a promise that whosoever cometh unto you, you will no wise cast away. We are coming back home. We are coming back home. We are coming back home. We want to remain with you. We want to live with you. We want to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. We want to preach the word. We want to remain faithful and loyal and obedient, watching unto the coming of the Lord. Father, receive us in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, no matter what is happening in the world or in the church, anywhere, let anybody fall. Let the tree be falling. Let the lion be running. Let the stormy sea be raging. Father, we are making up our mind. We are going to serve you. We are going to serve you. We are going to serve you. Help us to serve you in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, we lay everything down. Our talent, our money, our time, our energy, our life. We have only one life to live. Father, we pray that nothing, not in this world, will make us to be shaken in Jesus' name. We are going to remain consistent. We are going to remain loyal. We are going to remain obedient. We are going to remain fervent. We are going to remain steadfast. Help us in Jesus' name. Lord, we are praying. Because this week, you have visited us. You have revived us. You have blessed us. You have opened our eyes. You have given us new vision, new seal. You have exalted us. Lord, we pray that all days that you have received from your hand, that the devil, the enemy of our soul, will not be able to snatch them from our hands in Jesus' name. Devil, you are a liar. Devil, you are a liar. We are going to go through. We are going to make it to the end. We have laid our hand upon the plow. And there is no looking back. There is no looking back in Jesus' name. No matter what people are doing. No matter who is going away. No matter who is changing. No matter who is late. No reducing this. Glory the standard of the world. Lord, our eyes are upon you. Our eyes are upon you. We are going to see you face to face. What a wonderful thing to see Jesus with our eyes. To see Jesus that you are reading, that you have read about. What will be, how will it be? Where we see Peter, where we see Paul, where we see Joseph, where we see the saints of all. Father, help us in Jesus' name. 
Lord, we need your grace. We need your enablement. We need your power. We need your anointing. We pray. Give unto us in Jesus' name. We are praying for the church as a whole. Almighty God, we pray that the church as a whole will remain as your part unto you in Jesus' name. We believe that you have answered us. Lord, as we go, we pray that you go with us. We pray that you remain with us. We pray that you abide with us. We pray that you be in the front and we follow you in Jesus' name. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh